Well, uh, let's begin by, look, by reading the passage. I'm almost just launched into it, forgetting that you know, in the mornings we usually read the passage uh, in our scripture reading. But let's go ahead and look at it now. We're looking at Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Beginning in verse 1, we read this. Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, We worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear. From now on you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Well, again, may the Lord bless uh, his word to our hearing this evening. Now, again, just as a reminder this morning, we we saw our our Lord's uh, authority, His authority in the Word of God, His authority over the demons, His authority over sickness, and we were reminded as well about His authority over the devil and even over His own life. And remember that through this exhibition of His authority, He was showing us who He is, that He is the Messiah, He is the Son of God, He is the one the Father sent into the world not only to save us, but also to be the king over all creation and being king that we should submit to his authority because one day we are going to have to give an account to him. Now, we also saw the, uh, from the reaction of those that were in the synagogue, the only way we can really get ready for that day and the way that ultimately we're going to be able to... Um, Uh, obey the Lord and submit to His authority in the way that we should, and that is by trusting Jesus, because really it's the only way we can love Him. Remember those in the synagogue who heard His authority and saw His authority over the demons were amazed uh, at the way that, that He was teaching and, again, His ability to command demons. And when he left to go to a solitary place in order to refresh himself, they even went out looking for him and begging him to stay rather than to leave. And yet we also noted that later these same people would reject Jesus because they really didn't know him. They really didn't love him. So if we want to be ready for that day, if we want to have that power to be able to submit to the Lord who has really authority over all things, we do need to trust in Jesus. And we, know, we need to know that we are trusting in the Lord by seeing within ourselves the evidence that we really do trust Him. And that evidence, again, amounts to love. Uh, love for the Lord, love to the degree that we are willing to turn away from our sins in order to follow him in his ways, and as we're going to see this evening, also willing to give up all we possess in order to follow him. Now, the fact that there are still so many people who don't know the Lord, who don't obey him, who aren't trusting in him, and so are not ready to stand before him, is really why tonight's message is, is so important. Uh, this morning we saw that Jesus said he couldn't stay in Capernaum because there were so many yet who hadn't heard the gospel and he needed to go and preach the gospel to them. Well, tonight, Jesus, knowing that the work would would be much greater than he would be able to to do in the short time that he was going to have uh, in this world, 
we, we see him now call some to help. Now, we see, I think, two things in our passage. We, we do see, again, our Lord revealing himself through the miracle of the great catch of, of fish. But we also see the calling of his first disciples to be his helpers. And I think we also see implied in this encouragement to them that the work that he is calling them to do is not going to be a fool's errand, but it's actually going to be very successful. Now, first of all, we see Jesus revealing himself through the miracle of this great catch. Uh, last time we saw Jesus this morning, uh, he was preaching throughout Judea, which um, uh, is, I think Luke here is using the term perhaps more broadly, uh, including Galilee, because it's essentially that is where Jesus was ministering throughout the synagogues of Galilee. But after he did that, he, he returns to Capernaum, and he went down to the shore of Lake Gennesaret. Now, Lake Gennesaret, you, you likely know, is simply another name for the Sea of Galilee, uh, so-called because of a city by that name, which is on the western shore just below Capernaum. And again, uh, that's why the sea is called, or the, the lake is called, uh, Lake Gennesaret. And this lake is, is really a uh, large freshwater lake. Uh, and to give it perhaps, you know, sometimes we think of the Sea of Galilee as being this gigantic uh, body of water. It, it is fairly significant. It has 33 miles of shoreline. And from what I have read, it has a maximum depth of 141 feet, which, which you know, isn't shallow, but it's, it's not terribly deep. If we compare this to uh, Lake Tahoe, which I think is perhaps, I don't know if it's the, the largest body, inland body of water, but it's certainly one of the largest. It has 71 miles of shoreline and a maximum depth of about 1,645 feet. If you've ever been to Lake Tahoe, you've seen a lake which is significantly larger than the Sea of Galilee. Well, Jesus was standing, Luke tells us, at the harbor uh, where the ships made land. And because of his popularity, um, as he was teaching, a crowd had gathered to him. And because uh, they were so large and so uh, desirous to hear him, they were pressing in on him to the point where he got into a boat and asked its owner, which in this case was Simon, whom Jesus already knew because um, he had healed Simon's mother-in-law, Peter's mother-in-law, and uh, because Jesus was actually staying at his home, he asked Simon to uh, put out a little bit from the land so he could put some distance between himself and the people that he was teaching. And when he had, Jesus sat down. Again, that was the notice each time Jesus goes to sit. Sermon on the Mount in the synagogue, now in the boat. He always sits down and begins to teach. Maybe I should get a chair up here. <laughs> it, that seems to be the posture of the teachers, and we certainly do want to follow Scripture. But anyway, okay. Actually, I think it was uh, common for the, um, the one who was teaching to sit and the people who were listening to stand. Wouldn't that be a, a change? <laughs> but anyway, he sat down and began to teach them. Now, we're not told by Luke exactly what Jesus taught on this occasion. He doesn't always tell us. Uh, remember the first time he did and he, you know, the, he was speaking from Isaiah. It had to do with Messiah. And he says, you know, today this scripture has been fulfilled and we saw what, what happened in that case. Uh, the next time it, it really wasn't what he was teaching, but it was the authority with which he taught and the power of his message to deliver people from demon possession. Well, here, Luke, again, is not really focusing on what it was he was teaching. But let me just stop for a moment and, and just mention this. We do know when we look at the teachings of Jesus that everything that he had to, to teach, everything he preached, had to do with evangelism. It had to do with the kingdom of God. It had to do with how he was the fulfillment of all these things and how they needed to trust and receive him in order to enter into the kingdom. So undoubtedly, he was talking teaching about these things. And since that was the focus of what Jesus would say whenever he had something to say about the kingdom of, of heaven, uh, that's something that we also ought to be ready to share. And we think about the fact that we're a part of the Great Commission and how we are to have a, a bag of seed ready at all times to be able to sow the gospel. Uh, when we're going to minister, we need to think about bringing in the gospel. Don't just argue apologetics, uh, you know, get down to what is really necessary to get them ready 
for the day of judgment, and that is the gospel. But as I've said, Luke had a different focus here. He doesn't want to zero in on what Jesus was teaching on this particular occasion, but rather he wants us to see the miracle that Jesus does next. So when Jesus finished speaking, he then said to Simon in verse 4, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Now Simon replied, again, these very famous words that I think uh, we're all familiar with, and that is, um, you know, Master, we, we've just spent the whole night out there fishing, and though we worked very hard, we caught nothing, okay? Uh, Luke tells us that they had already landed their boats. They had taken their nets out. They were trying to get all the gunk out of it. They were washing their nets, getting all the, you know, the stuff that, that they would have caught besides the fish, which, of course, there were no fish, which means they were done for the day, and they were getting ready for the next day. You know, basically, it had been a fruitless evening. But since it was Jesus who was asking, Simon was willing to do it. Uh, again, knowing who Jesus is. Master, you know, he says, this is what we've done, but nevertheless, at your word, we'll do what you said. So he puts out again for the deep water, and they let down the nets. And when they had done this, it says they, uh, it's, he's not mentioned here, but, but the one that Simon was with in this particular boat was his brother Andrew, and we know that from a parallel passage. Uh, when they let down the nets, the nets encircled a large number of fish to the point where the nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boats, the people that they were working with, and as we know from this text, as well as, again, the parallel passage in Matthew, that was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, to come out and to help them. And they started unloading the nets while they were still out in the water. They hauled in so many fish that both of the boats were filled to the point that they began to sink. You know, if we just pause and think about this for a minute, this is very much like another time. Uh, this is after the ministry of Jesus when um, uh, apparently there was a, a, a period of time between the time that Jesus rose again from the dead and the disciples actually began doing the work where they had nothing else to do, so they thought they'd go out fishing. You know, that was their, their livelihood. They apparently still had their boats and, and their nets, and so they went out and they fished all night and they they caught absolutely nothing, and in the morning, they see Jesus on the shore, and he calls out to them, children, do you have any, do you have any fish? And they said, no, we haven't caught anything. He goes, well, throw your nets on the other side of the boat, and you will find something. And they did, and the, nets, uh, the, the net was filled with fish uh, to the point where they began to break, and they recognized that it was uh, Jesus. Now, we really need to ask the question, what, what difference does it really make which side of the boat that you're going to fish from, okay? Uh, it really makes no difference at all. Now, here they fished all night, and they caught nothing. The fish just weren't biting. You know, they weren't feeding. They weren't in areas where they could capture them with these nets. So what difference would it make if they put the nets down again? Well, humanly speaking, it, it's really not going to make any difference and the, the only difference here, of course, is that Jesus is the one who tells them to do it. Because Jesus doesn't just know where the fish are. He's the one who can call them to where he wants them to be. Jesus has authority over the fish. Now, the fact that this was miraculous, the fact that this was something that just doesn't ordinarily happen uh, unless Jesus is involved is quite clear from the reaction of these four fishermen uh, who, again, uh, knew the trade very well. We read in verses 8 through 10, But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Now, you know, Peter had, had seen what Jesus was able to do. I mean, he, he had been to the synagogue, he heard Jesus teach, he saw his power of the demons. He also had seen Jesus' ability to heal his mother-in-law. He knew Jesus had authority, but apparently this miracle was far more impressive than the ones he had already seen. Uh, one thing that's true about the miracles that Jesus did, 
that they are not like the kinds of miracles that people lay claim to today. I, I've mentioned this before, but I came from a background that was uh, full gospel and Pentecostal in my teenage years. And there were a lot of miracles that were being claimed, but there was nothing that you could actually see. Somebody said, I feel better, but it's not something that you could you know, just really see that something had actually changed, that something had really happened. That's not the kind of miracle that Jesus did. The kind of miracles he did were obvious. They stopped traffic. They created a sense of fear and amazement because there was no question that something supernatural had taken place. And that's, again, what we see in Peter. The first thing that, Peter, that comes to Peter's mind when he, when he saw this was what Jesus really meant for this miracle to do. He asked the question, who is this one? And he realizes it's the Lord, the covenant God of Israel. Something that would become clearer, I think, uh, later on in the ministry, but some of that light begins to break through in his mind who Jesus actually is. Uh, the second thing was who he was in comparison to this man. Depart from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Now, this is the same reaction, remember, that Isaiah had when he stood in the presence of the Lord. We read in Isaiah 6, verse 5, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You know, Peter saw who Jesus was, and he knew who he was in comparison. You know, the thing is, we're so used to seeing Jesus as our Savior, as the one who loves us, as the one who came into the world to save us, uh, as the one that, that John, the beloved disciple, reclined on at the Last Supper. We, we see him as the one who's, who's just willing to, to take hold of us and, and to hold us up and to save us. Sometimes we tend to forget who he really is. As the demons recognized this morning, he is the Holy One of God. But I think the reason why we see Jesus the way we do is because that is, in fact, how the Holy God actually comes to us, right, with such grace and such mercy to win our hearts. He doesn't come to us to terrorize us. Uh, he may do that to, to make us aware of our sins and to get us to turn from those sins. And there are times, I mean, we, we know the fear of the Lord is still part of our experience, but we do need to recognize that Jesus essentially wins us over ultimately by love, by showing us his grace, showing us his mercy, opening our eyes to his glory so that we might um, receive him with our whole heart. Now, we see that kind of love revealed here in our Lord Jesus Christ because when Peter fell down at his feet and he begged him out of fear to leave, Jesus essentially said the same thing to him and used exactly the same words, as a matter of fact, that the angel said to Zacharias in the temple when he appeared to him to announce the, uh, the conception and birth of John the Baptist, and what the angel said to Mary when he appeared to her and told her that she was going to bear the Messiah, and what the angel said to the shepherds in the field on the night of Jesus' birth, Jesus said to Peter, do not be afraid. Uh, the words in the Greek essentially mean, I know that you're afraid, Peter. You need to stop being afraid. And you need to not be afraid because Jesus is telling Peter, I didn't come to condemn you, Peter. I came rather to reveal myself to you that I might save you. And because I love you. And, more, well, not more importantly, but at least equally importantly, because I have a job uh, for you to do. And I think that's the second reason or the second thing we see here is that the reason why the Lord did this miracle is because he wanted Peter, as well as the others, to be a part of a fishing expedition uh, that Jesus had already embarked on. He had already started his ministry, you know, to, to go out fishing and to preach the gospel. He says to Peter in Luke chapter, uh, I guess it's chapter 5, verse 10, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. Now, here is the call of the very first disciple. And we see in this passage as well that he called the others 
Andrew, who isn't named here for I'm not sure what reason, and then James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And we also see something else that's very instructive. They immediately submitted to Jesus' call. Verse 11, when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. They, they basically just turned their back on what they had been doing. It was the morning, and they began to follow Jesus. Uh, what that means is they left their worldly employment. Whatever it is they hoped to gain from their trade, they even left their families. Remember, we noted that this morning, that uh, Peter had a mother-in-law. He was married. The other disciples apparently were married as well, and the brothers of our Lord were married. And um, we just don't see that relationship emphasized because they left them for a period of time, and they began to follow Jesus, to follow Jesus so that they might become fishers of men. Now, Let's return to the miracle of the fish for just a moment uh, to find another lesson, I think, that's implied here. Uh, we understand that Jesus did this miracle in order to show them who he was and why it is they should follow him. Uh, he is the Lord. He did this miracle. He shows that he is the sovereign over the world. He has control. He's the one that brought the fish into the net. But it also seems likely that it was meant to show them that they would be successful if they were to follow Jesus and join him in this particular venture. I mean, just as Jesus has absolute control over the things that we've seen, and as he just showed them, over the fish to bring them into the net, so he is able to bring the souls of his people to faith. Those whom the Father has given to Jesus for the work that he has set out to do. In other words, Jesus knew that as he went out fishing, he would catch the ones that he was after. Uh, Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse 37, um, this was his, his confidence. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. What was Jesus' encouragement? All that the Father gives me will come to me. Okay, there was no question, there was no doubt. So, what is it that we can learn from this particular passage? Well, I think the first thing is that if we're trusting in Jesus, we need to realize that we are part of this group that Jesus is talking about, all that the Father has given to Him. The Father has given us to Jesus. We are a part of Jesus' reward. We are His possession. We are His people. We are His flock. We are His bride. We are His body. We are His temple. There are just many different illustrations in Scripture that remind us that we belong to Jesus. Uh, Jesus went out fishing, and he entrusted this fishing to other fishermen, and they've been casting the net year after year throughout the centuries, and the Father, in his sovereign good pleasure and in his mercy, was pleased to bring us into that net. So that was the Lord's mercy, that we were caught, okay, and we we're in the kingdom. But we also see from this text that Jesus didn't catch us just to release us. You know, there's that idea of catch and release. <laughs> he didn't catch us to release us. He didn't catch us also to stuff us and make us trophies on his wall. You know, some, some people have, I think those are stuffed fish or whatever it is that, that are on the wall, okay? But rather, he saved us to do what it is that he was doing. Same thing that he called these disciples to do. Also that we might become fishers of, of men. And really, I think in a parallel way to the disciples, Jesus intends for this to be also our full-time occupation, only we carry it out in a way that's different from that of the disciples. As we go about our business from day to day, wherever the Lord has called us and whatever He's called us to do, remember what we saw not too long ago, something that Luther said that, that was true and what he preached to his people that we are to be Christ to those who are around us. We are to represent Him. We are to be like Him. We are to stand out like Jesus. Jesus certainly stood out wherever He was because He was different. We are to be different. He acted differently. We are to act differently. He talked differently. We are to talk differently from the rest of the world. And like Jesus, we are also to serve. I mean, Jesus didn't expect people to wait on him, 
but he waited on them. He served them. This is really, if we back up again just for a second, whenever the Lord gives authority, whenever he gives power, whenever he gives strength, it is meant for the purpose of service. There was no one that had more authority than Jesus, no one that had more resources, more gifts, more power than Jesus, and yet he was the one who served his disciples. The Lord has caught us in order that we might serve, and he also wants us to cast our nets. He wants us to be fishermen by telling other people the message of the gospel. Remember, whatever we do by way of uh, the way we act and speak and so forth, our character may be different, but uh, you probably heard the joke that as uh, one person was watching this other individual and observing him, you know, as this guy was a Christian and he was, you know, the person that, that this person, this unbeliever was watching was a Christian. And he observes him day after day and one day then he comes to this Christian and he says, uh, I've noticed there's something different about you. And the Christian thinks, oh, great, my witness has paid off uh, the way that I live, my shining my light for Christ. And, and so then the guy says, are you a vegetarian? Okay. The thing is, unless there's verbal communication, you know, there, there isn't really going to, it's not going to make any difference. They're not going to know who you are and why you're behaving differently. We need to identify with Jesus vocally, and we need also to share the gospel because of what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians one twenty one, as well as many of the places in Scripture, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Now notice the foolishness of the message, not that the message is foolish, but that's how the world will actually see it as foolishness. But this message that looks like foolishness to this wise world is actually the wisdom of God to save. And it is the power of God. It is the message he makes powerful to save. So the Lord has called us to be fishermen and to be fishermen. We do need to serve, but we also need to cast the net by explaining the gospel to them. Now, secondly, as we do this, we do need to be encouraged that the Lord will actually use that message to save those who are His. Now, again, we can tie this to the idea of foolishness. You know, the, when we look at the world and, and we see just how far away they have gone from the Lord in His truth, it, it can appear to us that it's going to be impossible that any of them would ever be interested in what we have to say because it's going to look to them as pure foolishness. But we do need to remember that the Lord uh, not only can bring uh, fish into the net, uh, you know, people into the net, as easily as he brought those fish into the net that he did for the disciples that we've just read about, he will actually bring them into the net. His sheep will hear his voice, and they will come. That's what Jesus said. And Jesus, of course, knows the truth and speaks the truth. Now, that fact has been the, really the encouragement of every Calvinistic evangelist who has ever set his hand to the work. Now, we know there's differing views on, on this. There's, well, I guess, two categories, Calvinist, Arminian, God is sovereign, Man ultimately makes the choice, and uh, perhaps for the people who don't believe God is sovereign, they're banking on the fact that they're going to be able to persuade and move people to come. Well, we know from what the Bible says about mankind that they'd never be convinced to come because their hearts are dark and evil, they hate God, they're dead in trespass and sin. That's why Calvinists, you know, Calvinism, if I can use that term, the idea of God's sovereignty, the fact that he's the one who ultimately is going to bring people to faith in Christ gives us the hope and the expectation that there are actually going to be people who are saved. You know, Whitfield, it's been said by those who don't believe in the sovereignty of God that um, Calvinism or the idea of God's sovereignty kills evangelism because you're just going to assume that people are going to be saved regardless of what you do and, you know, if they are elect, they will eventually come and so forth. But it's really the, the, the fact that God is going to save people that gives the Calvinistic evangelist, the one who believes in God's sovereignty, the motivation to go out and do it, the greatest evangelists who ever lived were all Calvinistic, were all believed in God's sovereignty. Jesus, 
all the Father gives to me will come to me, right? Uh, the Apostle Paul and certainly George Whitfield. You know, the idea of God's sovereignty doesn't kill evangelism. It actually encourages evangelism. And that's the encouragement that God wants us to take from this passage of Scripture. The Lord will bring his sheep into the fold. They just need to hear his voice. And the way that he speaks to them is actually through us. He doesn't speak directly from heaven. It, it's not something that, that he just sort of puts into the minds of men as they're walking along, but rather he speaks through us. It's not just through us. We have to share the message, but it's through that message shared that the Lord is going to speak. And unless they hear the message, they will not hear his voice, which is why Paul says in Romans chapter 10, how shall they hear unless one is sent? So there has to be the sending. And Jesus tells us in the Bible that he has sent us to do that. So may the Lord give to us the love that we need, the concern for our fellow man, and the courage that we need, not to worry about what other people might think about us, to tell others about his gospel, remembering again that if they don't hear it, they're going to stand before the Lord on the day of judgment, and they're going to have to give an account of every one of their sins, even every idle word that they've spoken. And none of them will be able to stand. They will all be swept away into the lake of fire. The only people who are going to stand are those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, who love him and are following him. And the only way that's going to happen is if they hear the gospel and God is pleased to save them. So we need to get the message out. May the Lord help us then and give us grace to be his fishermen. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to... Uh, to give us that grace.